Hey, open your Bibles to John chapter 12, Palm Sunday. Where's the palm branches you promised me, Lazo? They're coming, okay. <laughs> this is no ordinary day. Jesus would initiate this week that would start a week that would change the course of history forever. So before we get into the Word of God, I'd like to pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would speak to our hearts, our minds, and our souls in regards to the significance of this text on this day. We're hungry, Lord, and we come at your feet asking in confidence that you will speak. We're thankful for your word that you preserve for thousands of years that we might be able to hear from you. Speak to us now. We pray in your precious name. All, all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Well, I'm going to be reading from John 12, 12, and um, I got my New King James version of the Bible. I can't depart from it. I tried other um, translations, and they're awesome, but when I'm preaching, I got to go back to this one. It's got my little thumb mark right there where I hold it. And you know where the pages are? You know all the pages? And sometimes I can't even remember the text. I'm like, it's on the top right about middle. It's right there. It's good to have your Bibles. And so as you have them, open them up. No at all. No condemnation for those of you who are using your device. <laughs> the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And they cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, he sat on it. As it was written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they had remembered that these things had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, bore witness. For this reason, the people also met him, because they had heard that he had done this great sign. And the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see, that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The world has gone after him. This text is a real significant text I want to point out three things that I believe this morning will help us as we march into next week, which is the day we celebrate the resurrection of our King Jesus. And the three things that I want to point out that are significant is the place, the purpose, and the posture, right? Every preacher's got to have his three Ps, and those are mine. But before we go into the text, I want to get a little context, a little context of what's going on here. At the beginning of the chapter, we see one of the most beautiful acts of worship. As Mary is anointing the feet of Jesus, and she breaks the alabaster jar, and she's wiping his feet with her hair. 
and an act of worship that just speaks beyond comprehension for you and I. Because it's even hard to go back into that context of what was happening to understand that this woman was on her knees washing the feet of Jesus, anointing his feet with the oil that was somewhat, some people say, a year's wage. And in other gospels, the, the account would, would, would be one of the disciples say, what are you doing? You're wasting that oil. It could have been sold and we could have fed the poor. We could have done so much more than just spill it on his feet. And I'm sure the other disciples were just kind of ignoring the fact that she's wiping his feet with her hair. Right? If you're there, you're for sure going, well, yeah, I don't want to see that. What is that? I don't even have hair, and it seems weird. <laughs> but it was happening. And the reason why it's known as one of these great acts of worship is because she was all in. Everything she had was poured out at his feet. Even the, the, the thing that's most important, like just scrubbing his feet in preparation for what was about to take place. In other words, women, she was tuned in. She was locked in to who Jesus really was. The guys that Jesus had been pouring into, they were still clueless. Even when this went down, the scripture even says they were like, they just didn't know. It wasn't until his ascension that they were like, oh yeah, the donkey. I don't know about you, but I, I think that's funny when I read that. It's always perplexed me, especially in regards to this text of Mary anointing Jesus' feet. I'm wondering, what are the other disciples? We hear what Judas is saying. I always wonder, why aren't the other disciples like, hey, Judas, I noticed that you're worried about this money thing all the time. And your hands are always kind of in the money box. You all right? It seemed like there was very minimal accountability within the disciples. Because in a lot of ways, they weren't getting it. And Jesus was about to start the week which is known as the triumphant entry. And he was about to go and, and do what we so needed as humanity, as the savior of the world. He was gonna die on a cross for the sins, for the ransom of many. And then he would raise on the third day, just as he said he would. He's gonna do all of that, and somehow they're, they're missing it a little bit. They got a little bit, but then they're just missing it a little bit. The point I'm trying to make is Mary was getting it. Out of all the disciples, when the crucifixion went down, it was the ladies that were gathered. It was the ladies at the tomb. Men, where you at? Right? It hurts as men were like, well, they were doing other stuff. Like betraying, denying, falling asleep during prayer meeting. <laughs> Man, I'm just saying, that's, that's where it's at right now. Luckily, the grace of God is available to us all. That's the backdrop. That's, that's the backdrop. And listen... Not only this coming off of just the situation with Mary washing uh, Jesus' feet, there's a buzz in the air in Jerusalem. Not just because it's Palm Sunday, but there's a buzz in the air because Jesus had just said to Lazarus, come forth. He rose someone from the dead. Up to this point, Jesus had done some stuff, but to raise someone from the dead, okay, feeding the, the 5,000, that's awesome. Cleansing, 
washing, healing. Now there's a buzz in the air because like, okay, there was a guy, he was dead, now he's not dead. Maybe he's the one. That's the backdrop here. And the significance of where all this went down is so important. The reason why it's so important, friends, is because over 400,000 years, or 400 years before this event took place, it was prophesied. I don't know about you, but me, when I was a young Christian, exploring what it meant to be a believer and looking to the word of God, it floored me. Wait a minute. 400 years before the event happened, it was prophesied. Yeah. Fulfilled to the T. Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. Jerusalem, the beloved city of David, the city of God, the city of truth. Jerusalem, in its very meaning, means the city of peace. One would find it hard to believe that it's the city of peace currently, right? You look at current affairs and events and you're like, well, there hasn't been peace in Jerusalem in a long time. Peace in the Middle East? It'll happen someday because it's prophesied. The second coming and the millennial reign. But until then, there is no peace without the Prince of Peace. Can I get an amen? Amen. So, Jerusalem, the city of peace. Why is it called the city of peace? That is the city in which God chose to bring peace to earth. And a baby, a gift to humanity. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And he chose Jerusalem, a place that would bring peace for those who would believe in the Prince of Peace. It's where God reconciled man. Humanity was reconciled. And as we look at at, uh, Good Friday, we understand that as believers, that the price that needed to be paid was paid in full by the Prince of Peace. You ever heard that phrase? It's not so much used anymore, but that phrase, that did you make your peace with God? Did he make his peace with God? Are you making your peace with God? It's actually a, it's a passage, and um, it's out of Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace, says the Lord, unto the wicked. There is no peace without the Prince of Peace. And this place in the Middle East is where God chose to make peace with a wicked generation. Humanity that had fallen so far, and yet, because of the very nature of who God is, desiring that peace to be restored, he sends his son to reconcile us. And Jesus, as he rode into Jerusalem, On Palm Sunday, you got to know something, that the donkey was a sign of a king would ride a donkey as a sign of peace, right? Because you kind of scratch your head, like, why the donkey? Why not a black stallion? I mean, the second coming has the white one, maybe the black one. (laughs) No. There's reasons why I don't make these things up, right? Right? God chose, used a prophet 400 years before it even happened to speak on that very thing at that very place, that the Messiah would come 
riding on a donkey. I, I even giggle saying the word donkey. Huh, donkey? <laughs> I'm sorry. But listen, God chose Jerusalem to make peace with humanity. And when he chose that, it's important to realize something that I've realized over the many years as I've been a pastor is that spaces and places are very important to God, to never underestimate them. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, where God had the temple set up, or the tabernacle, Spaces and places are important to God. I think as believers, we should equally have the same significance to spaces. Take, for instance, right here. Friends, we're in a theater at a high school. A high school, mind you, that has hundreds of kids who are lost, confused, hurting. I have the privilege of coming to San Marcos, Santa Barbara, DP, and I work with some of the kids, and I'm telling you, whatever you thought high school is like, it's twice or if not three times as bad. Because you think, well, high school was like this when I was in high school, so maybe it got a little worse. No. It actually got crazy worse. Here's why. You could be in your science class, and you're sitting around with some friends, and you're like, what do you want? Oh, okay. Some weed? Heroin? Oh, no? You okay? Okay, she'll be there for you. Call the Uber. Uber sets up. Yeah. Okay, Uber's going to pick us up at the flagpole in about 15 minutes. I'll see you guys there. That happens. And where they're going is not to get tacos. They're going to a place where they're going to do all the drugs and do all the things that you're imagining that they're doing. They're actually doing it, but they're doing it in your homes, your neighbor's homes. And it's, it's an epidemic within this society right here that we call beautiful Santa Barbara. And we're meeting here. And we're worshiping Jesus and we're hearing the word of God. And friends, I'm telling you, it excites me. Because this campus needs nothing more than more Jesus. But the government has locked them out. But we can bring them back in. Here we are. It's amazing, isn't it? It really is. So when you come in on Sundays, come in with an intentionality of spaces are important to God. As you're walking from in, in this campus, be praying. Be praying for people that you might think are in trouble, kids. It's significance. And here we are. It's amazing. Where do you live? I live at 5550 Casitas Pass. That's where God has me. I endeavor to make my house a house of peace. As the man of the house, I endeavor to make my house a house of peace. Now listen, I'm not going to try to paint you a picture that doesn't exist. I have three teenage daughters. A little more sympathy for me. <laughs> They're amazing daughters. Is there always peace in my home? I have three daughters, man. <laughs> right? My little son, we're just like, hey, let's go to the garage. Stuff happens, but it's still my job to keep the peace. The peace that has been given to me by God is not to be hoarded. It's to be given. Peace and love should mark Christians more often, especially in your homes. And I'm not trying to try to get that condemnation face, but friends, Listen to me. Your home is important. 
who reside there are important. They're important to God. They should be important to you. And maybe you're... You're seasoned and you, don't, you have an empty house? Well, then pray about what God would want to do with your empty house. Maybe you have a full house and sometimes it seems out of control. Do what you need to do to sustain peace, the peace of God in there. My kids, their friends come over to our house and to God be the glory, I know that it's the peace of God that their friends feel. They want to come there. Not because we're amazing. If anything, we've proven that we're not amazing. We're just willing to allow the peace of God. Your home is significant. Where this church is, is significant. Where God chose to redeem humanity, significant to him. Well, I don't own a home. Wherever you're resting your head. Right? God's not looking and saying, well, your, your name's not on the deed, so no longer will I have peace upon your home. <laughs> we don't own this building, but it's significant. Where do you work? Significant to God. It's where you're at, whether you like it or not. Maybe you're trying to wiggle out of your job. Know this. God has you there right now. He's called you to be a peacemaker. Peacemaker in your office. Sometimes it's a daunting idea because there's just a lot of stuff sometimes at work. People are working. But if you endeavor to go in with the heart of God, what will ooze out of you is love and peace. Amen? It's, I can't even believe I have it written here. Where you are is where you're at. <laughs> it's deep, huh? <laughs> where you are is where you're at. That's where God has you. Maybe you don't like it. Maybe it's hard. But friends, I'm telling you, the more you get your eyes off of yourself and just, okay, what, am, what is going on here? Where am I? This is where I am. I'm going to be most effective where I am. Because it's significant. You're significant to God, and where you are and where you reside is significant to him. And Jesus, in fulfilling that prophecy, it was important to God. But not only was he fulfilling prophecy of where, he was also fulfilling prophecy of why. Matter of fact, far more prophecies written about the purpose of what God was to do, reconcile humanity. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm, I'm trusting as believers we get the significance of what Jesus was doing. Because it was obvious that he wasn't coming to, to just check things out, kick the tires, so to speak. He created this world. He wasn't coming to check it out. He came because there was a broken relationship and he wanted to restore it. He is the Prince of Peace, bringing peace where there was animosity. And again, the triumphant entry, this picture of him riding on a donkey, it blows my mind. It would be like the United Nations having a meeting and as ambassadors, the, the British ambassador, he rolls up in his Rolls Royce. Thank you, kind sir. <laughs> right? Then you have the ambassador from Japan. He rolls up in his sweet Lexus, just twin turbo. He gets out. Oh, thank you, sir. And then, of course, The Italian, they got to roll up in a Lamborghini or something like that, really nice. And then south of the border, you got some Mexican rolling up in a 6'4 Impala, (laughs) just top down, riding low with some, some Dayton's and stuff. 
And then here you come, the ambassador for America. A borrowed pinno. <laughs> what? A borrowed pinno, not just a pinno, a borrowed one. That's what it's like for the king of the universe, deity, coming to earth, rolling up on the triumphant entry on a donkey. Friends, that speaks of immense humility. Because again, if it was me, I mean, 57 Chevy, something else, not the borrowed pinno. But it was significant because it was significant to God. It showed great humility. And here's what I love about our Savior. Always up to the task. It was at this point that Jesus was presenting himself to Jerusalem. This was, this was his big parade. And the float he chose was a donkey. Friends, that right there speaks of how crazy the kingdom of God is. It's so different. The gospel turns everything upside down. It defines success in terms of giving, not taking. Self-sacrifice, not self-protection. Going to the back of the line, not in front of the line. It is crazy. People's mentality. Like, I've, I've just done it just to do it. You're at Starbucks. Go ahead and go in front of me. What? What do you want? Right? It's because being nice and being kind is almost like, wow. You'd be surprised at how many conversations can be sparked just by letting someone in front of you at a line. And it doesn't matter where, right? You're at Vaughn's and someone's at, offering you to, like, what? This is Christmas or something. It's a, it's a way of sparking conversation, but not only that, sharing the love and the peace of God. Funny little side note right there. I don't know why that happened. <laughs> Wasn't intended. The gospel changes everything. We achieve power through service. We become rich by giving ourselves away. Jesus preached it, and he lived it. And here is an example right here, this text. Jesus riding into town as a lamb being led to the slaughter, according to Isaiah 53, 7. We sing that song, The Lion and the Lamb. The lion comes out when he comes the second time. The first time he came as a sacrificial lamb. And who were the people present for all this to happen? The religious leaders, the rich, the poor, the common, the well-to-do. They were all there. And it trips me out that the religious leaders, in chapter 11 already, when, when, when Jesus had spoken to Lazarus to come out of the grave, the religious leaders were undone. At that point, if you're the high priest and I'm with you, I'm like, you know what? Homie's raising people from the dead. I'm out. <laughs> Your gig's not working. Listen, friends, that's what religiosity does. It blinds you so bad. Can you imagine that? You're, a, you're one of the Pharisees getting mad at Jesus from raising people from the dead. <laughs> that's crazy. But they were even more infuriated. They were getting so mad that 
all of Israel has got the palm branches and they're just, they're just loving Jesus riding on this donkey and they're just pulling their hair. They're like, I can't believe this. They're becoming undone. Friends, beware of religiosity. Don't ever be in that place. When you find yourself going like this, coming out of church, something's wrong. When you leave church and your list of the things that are wrong with the church service versus the things that God is speaking to you, you're wrong. Something's wrong with you. Stop it. <laughs> but Jesus, as they're singing Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, all those people Bless their hearts. They thought this is the Messiah who has come to relieve us of the oppression of Rome. They, they kind of had it off, but they were worshiping, and they had their, their uh, palm uh, tree, and they were waving those, and he's riding on the donkey, and they're throwing things. And it was just a huge parade, and everyone's excited, and Jesus received it all. Because he was declaring to himself, this is who I am, the king. But even though their hearts were off and not quite getting it right, he received the worship. So much so that in the account in Luke, he tells the Pharisees, because the Pharisees are like, man, they're chanting these things. They can't be saying those things. That's a messianic uh, psalm that they're, they're singing. They were coming undone, and Jesus said to them, hey, if they don't cry out, the rocks will. In other words, I'm genuine and real. If there's anyone that deserves worship, it's me. Even though their hearts weren't quite right, he still received the worship. So much so that he told the Pharisees, like, hey, no, 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 you let them sing. Because if they don't, the rocks will. There's an old hymn, it's called, Ain't No Rock Gonna Cry in My Place. As long as I'm alive, to glorify his holy name. Ain't no rock gonna cry in my place. Not as, not, not as long as I'm alive. Friends, that's the posture we need to have. The posture of worship, of understanding the significance of where we are, the significance of who he is, puts us in the right posture. The people there in Jerusalem, they had the right posture. Even though they were slightly off, they had the palm branches. They were glorifying, singing, Hosanna, which means save now. I've, I adopted that vernacular in my everyday life since Chris asked me to teach. Late at night, can't go to sleep, Hosanna, help me God. You got a bunch of tacos in front of you and you need help because you've, you suffer from gluttony, Hosanna. <laughs> Listen, might be a wrong application of it, but it's helping me. <laughs> I need a lot of help. We need a lot of help. Allow Hosanna to enter into your vernacular more frequently. Ask, seek, and knock. But friends, this comes down to the proper posture. You and I, right now, are going to transition into worship. In light of where we are and who we're singing to. Don't really need to say much other than this. I loved it. When I looked at this passage, I was like, dude, this thing is bookend by worship. You got Mary and you got the masses. And every preacher is going to be like, who do you want to be? Do you want to be like Mary who gets it or be like the masses who's out there and they're all pumped, but a little less than a week later, crucify him. They were a little off, but Jesus still received the worship. The bottom line is, don't be the masses. But in reality, we are 
all kind of there sometimes. You're sitting there, and sometimes your heart's not all the way there. The only thing I would say to you as a friend, as a pastor, as a brother, is press in. Because in worship, something happens in corporate worship that cannot be duplicated. You can't fit in, maybe, maybe you can sit in front of a screen and get what is happening in here. Not me. I see the significance of this gathering. This is very significant. And here we are about to sing Hosanna, about to praise God in a place where we're thinking each one reach one. Oh, the kids in this school. Friends, there's so much to think and pray and give praises and prayer for. It's almost like enough, G, leave. We got to get in. We got to sing Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That phrase alone deserves worship. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. God has sent the Son. The Son has come. He did what he had to do. He rode the donkey in humility all for you and me. To be in this place of significance. To worship the one of great significance. Let's posture ourselves right. There's going to be a prayer team. The worship team's going to come back out. And friends, I'm confident. As we begin to worship, this is, is going to be different today. You know why? Simply because God is doing something. And so you got to ask yourself, where do I want to line up with? Do I want to be like Mary? Maybe you're not all the way there. Maybe you don't even have hair, and you, you just, just doesn't make sense for you. It's the intent. The intent. I found that in worship, where is that worship team? <laughs> I found that in worship, God can answer a lifetime of questions. His testimony was, I, I was there during worship, went up for prayer. Friends, this space cannot be duplicated. It's being duplicated other places for other people. You're here. We're here. Let's make it count. We serve a king that is worthy. Amen? Lord, thank you that you are so worthy. We're so humbled to gather in your name. We're so blessed. We sing Hosanna. Glory in the highest. We're excited what you're going to do next week. Lord, I'm anticipating you doing great and mighty things next week. But Lord, we know that there's a significance right now. And so we want to sit at your feet. Some need to just cry out and lift up their hands. Lord, some just need to be healed of religiosity. Lord, there's men here that took that challenge of of their homes being a place of peace. Lord, come. Make peace. Do what you do. We need you to come in your fullness. We're trusting you. We're asking that you do these things. In your precious name we pray. 